So our third presenter today is Mark Olson, and he is the Elizabeth K. Dollar Professor of Psychiatry, um, Medicine, and Law, and Professor of Epidemiology at the New York State Psychiatric Institute, the Columbia University Bahalas College of Physicians and Surgeons. Mark is interested in identifying gaps between clinical science and practice in behavioral health care, including a focus on suicide prevention and improving the treatment of adults with serious mental illness and substance use disorders. He has brought attention to problems in the quality of assessment and treatment of children and adults with behavioral health disorders, including an emphasis on neglected and underserved populations. And his talk today is on MDAC and insights into epidemiology and deaths of despair. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Kathy. Um, and this afternoon, as you can see, I'll uh, describe our recently completed work with the MDAC on epidemiology of the deaths of despair, uh, by which I mean suicide, drug overdose, and chronic liver disease. Um, here's a list of uh, my potential conflicts of interest. These are organizations from which I've received income in the last few years. Now, um, one reason that this topic is so important is that over the past uh, couple of decades, we've seen rising rates of suicide, drug overdose, and chronic liver disease deaths uh, in the United States. And these trends stand in sharp contrast to the really impressive declines that have been achieved in some of the other leading causes of deaths you see on the slide here, such as pneumonia, heart disease, cancer, and HIV AIDS. Um, now, uh, Anne Case and Angus Deaton at Princeton, as I mentioned, you know, published a highly influential article uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences back in 2015 on the deaths of despair. And what they did is they attributed the recent decline in life expectancy of middle-aged white men and women, especially those with less than a college education, to these three causes, suicide, drug overdose, and chronic liver disease. And it was their view that it was the thwarting of personal expectations that leads to despair. So here's a quote from one of their papers that, um, although not the famous paper, that captures their central argument where they, um, you know, where they wrote that um, people despair when their material and social circumstances are below what they expected. This despair leads people to act in ways that significantly harm their health, and this may have a direct impact on death through suicide or an indirect impact through heavy drinking, smoking, and drug abuse at root is economic and social uh, breakdown. So what they're arguing here is that economic and social collapse are primary or fundamental causes of, um, of, of these sources of morbidity. And, um, and so if we are to uh, think about their hypothesis or their assertion schematically, it might look something like this. Economic stagnation is driven by things like globalization and rapid technological change, loss of union power that shielded U.S. workers from competition from low-wage labor both here and abroad has narrowed job prospects and it's also accelerated declining rates of marriage and that's contributed to social isolation and loneliness, which in turn may have contributed to diseases of despair and ultimately to deaths of despair. Of course, you know, they did their work before the pandemic, but in the last year or so, all of this has been dramatically exacerbated by the economic disruption and loss of jobs that's been brought on um, by the pandemic. Now, despite you know the widespread uh, public attention and interest in deaths of despair, longitudinal research hasn't previously examined the extent to which people with socioeconomic disadvantages actually are at increased risk for them as a group. And um, without prospectively evaluating these risks among living people at a population level, uh, you, you won't get um, rates of deaths of despair, and therefore they'll have less utility, as last week we were saying, than focusing on them um, at an individual level, particularly um, uh, so that it might offer an opportunity to, um, to get a better understanding. So, um, so what we did is we're trying to, what's motivating the study is we're looking for connections between markers of socioeconomic adversity and deaths of despair because it, it might have implications for the broad direction of U.S. social and health policy. If we either find strong associations, it might help make the case for upstream interventions, things like raising the minimum wage, increasing public support for job training, 
expanding investment in public education and loan forgiveness, increasing the availability of health insurance or public support for health insurance for low-income people, subsidizing child care, and so forth. On the other hand, if there were weaker linkages between markers of socioeconomic adversity and these causes of death, it might suggest that we emphasize more narrower downstream focus on individual level interventions, things like um, suicide screening and linking uh, people who screen positive to mental health services and uh, developing crisis lines and advocating for firearm safety policies, and linking that with, with counseling to high-risk groups, trying to expand the reach of medication treatments for opioid use disorder, needle exchange programs, try to make naloxone reversals um, more broadly available and so forth. So those are sort of upstream and downstream approaches to the extent, again, that we see a link with socioeconomic adversity to these risks. It, it supports an emphasis on what I'm calling the um, upstream approaches. Now, so to um, examine this issue, um, I've had the, um, had the great pleasure of working with Carlos Blanco at NIDA and Melanie Wall at Columbia, as well as Candace Cosgrove at the Census Bureau and Sean Altacruz at the NHLBI. And uh, like the speakers before me, we've been analyzing the MDAC, and as you've heard now numerous times uh, today, uh, the, the MDAC was created by linking the 2008 American Community Survey to the 2008 to 2015 National Death Index. And so we've got four and a half million individuals, and over the course of the follow-up period, over 300,000 deaths. Um, and, you know, there are a number of strengths, as you've heard about them, one of which is the exceedingly high um, uh, response rate of 97.9%, and that's because the ACS is actually legally required uh, for people who are, or with, who are selected. It also has a very broad sampling frame, and it includes um, housing units and residential facilities, things like college dorms and nursing homes and prisons and homeless shelters. And so it really gives you a, a nearly comprehensive um, uh, view of, of people within the United States. There are a few groups, people who are literally homeless, some other groups on the slide that aren't captured. And um, um, as you see here, roughly 90% of the respondents uh, can be linked to the NDI. Those that can't, are most, it's mostly because uh, they don't have Social Security numbers. And you've heard also about a number of strengths of the MDAC, I want to draw your attention to what I think are three key strengths. Uh, as we've been describing, it's intensive size, and that enables researchers to focus on relatively rare causes of mortality and uncommon population groups. Um, we've, in addition to the work that I'll be describing to you momentarily about deaths of despair, we've also used this uh, data set to look at risk of firearm suicide among U.S. adults, linking in geographic data on firearm ownership and we've just completed and submitted some work on the relationship between living alone and, um, and uh, risks of suicide, which I think is uh, pertinent uh, given this time of COVID where there's lots of interest in, in, in social uh, isolation and its potential adverse psychological effects. Um, but also, so there's the completeness um, to the MDAC that I mentioned. It it's, has this very high response rate. It's also nationally representative, which is uncommon in mortality research. A lot of mortality research in the United States, anyway, is done with, you know, at the state level or done with particular groups, people of Medicaid or other insurance status, but this is truly national. And also it's prospective design, and so that gives it higher quality data then you get from simply um, analyzing death records. A lot of the information on death records, as you may know, is um, supplied by people who are next of kin proxy informants rather than obviously the individual, him or herself, who is deceased. So, um, so today, uh, I'm, I'll focus, as speakers before uh, may have, on um, issues of um, socioeconomic status and looking particularly at the role of and the relationship between low educational attainment, unemployment, low income, separate and divorce marital status in relationship to the deaths of despair. Um, and to put these analyses uh, and this topic in perspective, what we did is we first just looked among decedents from these three causes, and we focused on adults 18 and over, the proportion that were um, due to, to um, 
suicide, poisonings, and chronic liver disease. As you can see on the slide here, that collectively these three causes of death account for, uh, during this period, around one in every 25 deaths. And that's that 3.9% you see as the first entry in the total column. And you can also see that across these three um, causes of death that, um, that men contribute about twice the proportion of the deaths that women do. And so when you're thinking about these results, I think it's important to bear them this in mind as, as context. Now, the, um, the next four slides are organized so that the crude mortality rates um, across levels of the independent variable of interest are in the upper panel, and then results from a multivariable cost proportional hazards regression with 95% confidence intervals appear in the lower panels. And as you can see in the, at the bottom of the slide in the fine print list of all the covariates that are in the models that are also being controlled for. So if we first then look at the basic at these relationships between educational attainment at the time of the survey in 28, 2008, and the rates of, of suicide, poisoning, and chronic uh, liver disease, we see that the crude mortality rates, you see these gradients, especially for poisoning and chronic liver disease, is the highest risk among people with the lowest level of formal education. And then below, when we consider the hazards of mortality and adjust for that broad range of socioeconomic uh, social demographic characteristics and functional disability, you can see that the associations are somewhat attenuated. Um, and for suicide, there's a slight increase in risk for people having um, less than a bachelor's degree, and it's similar and somewhat stronger for chronic liver disease and more robust gradient uh, with respect to poisoning deaths. And now turning um, to employment, we similarly see an association between not being employed and uh, risk of each of these three causes of death and the unadjusted uh, crude rates above and in the adjusted analyses, um, the, the uh, association is stronger for poisoning and chronic liver disease than it is for suicide. Um, in terms of income, we again see this now familiar pattern with higher crude rates for suicide, poisoning, and chronic liver disease with a lower income, including especially high rates of poisoning deaths among people with net income losses, again, at the time of, of the survey in, in 2008. And in the uh, adjusted income analyses below, these associations have been largely absorbed, uh, maybe because of correlations among the socioeconomic variables. But even after adjusting for education, employment, and all the other variables you see listed there, the lowest income groups still have a significantly increased hazard of poisoning mortality in relation to the highest income groups, the lower and middle income adults have greater risk of chronic liver disease in, uh, than those in the highest group. And finally, if we, um, when we look at marital status, adults who are separated or divorced have high uh, crude mortality rates from all three causes of death, and widowed adults likely because they're older um, have elevated rates of chronic liver disease mortality. I, I didn't show you, but you know it's true that Almost all of the chronic liver disease deaths are occurring among people who are over age 40. Uh, it's because a lot of these deaths are from the slow-moving process of um, developing cirrhosis. So um, the adjusted, these adjusted hazards below tell a similar story, again, with the highest hazards, especially for poisoning deaths for separated and divorced um, people compared to married uh, individuals. So. Um, to summarize, uh, suicide, poisoning, chronic liver disease, the so-called deaths of despair make roughly equal contributions to mortality, and that men are especially vulnerable. Accidental poisoning appears to be the most sensitive, and suicide the least sensitive to markers of socioeconomic um, disadvantage. And again, separated and divorced adults, not employed individuals, are especially uh, at high risk, and to a lesser extent so are low-income people and those with less formal education. And all of this, uh, I think, provides support for the possibility, at least, that social policies that aim to improve a, a occupational opportunities and to uh, increase financial security and educational attainment, as well as those that seek to diminish social isolation, might have long-term benefits in lowering these uh, risks of death to despair. So in, in closing, let me reiterate that people who are financially vulnerable and those who do not work or have less education appear to be at increased risk of overdose deaths, 
and to a lesser extent chronic liver disease and suicide mortality. And again, as I indicate, for these reasons, these social policies that support education and employment might yield these long-term benefits in reducing the deaths of despair. However, um, you know, the, the deaths of despair share, and they have some overlapping socioeconomic risk factors. It's also, I think, very important to uh, bear in mind that these are really distinct clinical uh, phenomena, and they call for different um, clinical and service treatments and rehabilitation programs, and so that improving access to substance use and mental health services will also play a critically important role in achieving um, these public health goals. So um, thank you for your attention, and uh, I look forward to responding to your questions.